Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Kirby. It's great to have you join us this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. Hey, I want to highlight a couple things to you. One, I just want to thank you. I, I, you all are handling this um, in an amazing way, and I'm so proud and so impressed to be your pastor, to be serving alongside of you, and the way that uh, the stories I'm hearing of how we're reaching our neighbor, loving our community, has been just humbling. So thank you. Uh, for that. If you're new uh, to Living Hope, uh, welcome. We're glad you're joining us. Uh, today we're taking a little break from our current series called Covenant and Kingdom. We're going to take a break from that and it's pretty hard and heavy and so if you missed any of that you can jump in the first three weeks. Um, next week we're going to kick off the second half talking about the New Testament and the covenant and the kingdom. Uh, but I want to highlight a couple things to you. Today is Happy Mother's Day uh, to you moms, to your grandmas, to your great grandmas. Um, happy Mother's Day. Um, thank you so much for all you do. Uh, but we do know that and there are many people who are not mothers. There are many people who cannot uh, be a mother or uh, maybe have lost a child. And, and to you, uh, our hearts are with you as well. And we recognize the value of all women uh, regardless. Uh, but a couple other things. Um, we're going to be gathering online for a little while yet. And so thank you for the opportunity to join you in your living room or your couch. Um, but one day I'm really looking forward to having this space used again. This is our nursery. Um, but the biggest thing right now, we've got some high school seniors that are graduating high school. And we want to just bless the socks off of these high school seniors and thank them and, and encourage them and send them on their way to whatever next stage in their life is. Uh, if you've been receiving our emails, you've got a list of their names. We have 13 seniors at this church, uh, high school seniors. And so you got their names. So what we want to do is we're collecting gifts here at the church and we are putting them all together and we are going to deliver them. So it is not coming all from living hope. So personalize your gift, make it personal, make it from you, from your family to the specific student. And we are going to gather them at the church just to limit contact, limit uh, numbers and all that stuff. So send that to the church, drop it off. We are here at the church now. The, the church office is open as long as there's a staff member here. Um, but we, so drop those off and we're going to gather them and collect them and deliver them the week of the 17th of May. So please drop them off and, um, let's gather those together and just bless and encourage these high school seniors. If you didn't get that list or you want to know some more, Hey, we, uh, every week we send out a newsletter, um, and you can get that newsletter if we have your email, uh, and you can let us know, office at lhwc.org or in the comment section below, uh, you'll see a digital gift or a, excuse me, a digital con comment card or connection card uh, that we can get in touch with you on that. And you'll also find their uh, ways to give online. And that's all in the connection card um, comment section. Um, there are also songs to sing and, and join us as we worship together. Um, but right now, uh, we're really excited that Pastor Sheila has brought a message for us that'll just be encouraging and full of hope for you today. Well, good morning. I am Sheila Mott, the Connections Pastor here at Living Hope Church, and it is so good to be with you this way uh, this morning. Not as good as in person, but this has been crazy, hasn't it? We are eight weeks into COVID in South Dakota, and I don't know about your family, uh, but for my family, we've had to get creative about getting through this time, and one of our coping strategies has been reading books and watching movies. I love a good story and watching it unfold. Some of the best authors and producers, they begin by detailing this creative setting to begin the story. And then they bring in some interesting characters. They let us see their personality and uh, some of their quirky things and, and, and classic things. Uh, and then they start to tell the solid plot and the story's going along. And then at some point they introduce a conflict. And then the rest of the story is about using that conflict to develop the theme of the story. Now those stories in movies with a captivating conflict or an unexpected plot twist, those are the makings of classics. Take The Lion King, for example. Okay, now let me just stop and say, I'm sure I could have picked a more riveting movie, but the staff joke around here is that I am out of touch with pop culture. So Disney it is. So the first time I watched this movie, which wasn't that long ago, sadly, I'm watching Simba born as this cub and he's growing up and playing and his dad tells him that he's going to take over and be king of the Pride Lands someday. And so he's preparing for that. And uh, the conflict in the story comes when Mufasa and Simba are out and Mufasa is killed. 
and Simba thinks it's his fault and so he runs away. And that leaves us in the story saying, well, now what? He's supposed to take over the kingdom, but he's like walking out on the job. And the rest of the story unfolds the theme. Even the simplest of children's stories follow this pattern, like the tortoise and the hare. The setting, the author tells us, is a race scene. And the characters, we have a tortoise and we have a hare. The story begins to unfold and we can pretty much tell what's going to happen because it's predictable. But then the author uses a conflict, throws in a plot twist. In this case, the hare decides to take a nap because he thinks he's got the race in the bag. And so develops the theme of the story, slow and steady wins the race. Now, stories maybe not like the tortoise and the hare, but other stories and movies that maybe you're thinking of that are your favorites, they keep us on the edge of our seat. When you're watching a movie at that point where the plot twist comes in, you don't want to leave the room to go to the bathroom or get more popcorn. Uh, when you're reading a book, you can't put it down. It's a page turner. They make for great entertainment until they become our stories. So here we are in 2020. We get to the new year, 2019, the, it's ending and we think, good grief, this has to be, next year has to be better. Like 2019 was basically the end of the world. And so we're going along, we're hoping for this better year and bam, COVID creates a plot twist. We have all been impacted to one degree or another by COVID and we will continue to be for quite some time. Perhaps it will change our lives forever. This plot twist has drastically changed the story. I remember when it first hit, uh, the, when it first affected us, was the, when the, the band concert for fifth through 12th grade was canceled. My girls were devastated, in tears. I was angry. I actually initially posted a, a, a pretty inappropriate rant on Facebook and then edited it later. Then I went into denial thinking, oh, it's not gonna be that bad. And then started to be confused as more information came out and sad as so many things were changing. And, and then I would be optimistic, optimistic that we could do it. I've been all over the place trying to figure out how to function. How is this story unfolding and how do I take care of myself? There's these new limitations placed on us and maybe you find yourself fighting those limitations. We just want this to be over. We miss our family. We miss our friends, we miss our church, you. Now let's just take a moment to acknowledge that if moms had been in charge of COVID, it's not how they would have written the story. Moms have been, and dads have been heroes through this. So with it being Mother's Day today, just make sure you're showing mom a little extra love today. We can't imagine when we think about this plot twist, like how can God possibly use this conflict? to develop the themes that we, that we know are part of scripture and part of our faith, things like joy and peace and hope. And God wants to, how can he use that? Or call me crazy, but that's exactly what God wants to do. He wants us to have joy and peace and hope and so much more. And we can during a conflict because we can trust God to use our current conflict to develop the bigger story that he's writing for our lives. So we're gonna to look today at another story that had an unexpected plot twist. And this story comes from the book of 1 Peter, uh, the first nine verses of, of the letter that Peter writes. Uh, we put a video on fa Facebook this week to give a little bit of background uh, from the Bible Project so you could get familiar with the settings and the characters. But if you didn't get a chance to watch it, that's all right, we'll go over it here. So 1 Peter verse one, writes like this. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, if you remember, Peter was a disciple of Jesus' ministry while he was in Israel. And so after Jesus ascended into heaven, Peter then had a ministry to take the gospel beyond Israel. So he took it to parts of Asia, and this letter that he's writing is actually decades later after Jesus has ascended, and it's written to Christians who were recent converts as a result of his ministry. 
We believe they're mostly non-Jewish Christians living throughout Asia. Uh, these five provinces he lists are actually in what is now today the area of Turkey. And depending on the translation that you read, these people, are, these Christians are referred to as scattered exiles or foreigners. They left the Greek and Roman religion where they were worshiping all these different gods and chose to follow Jesus Christ. So whether they were geographically exiled and isolated and scattered, or whether they were just feeling scattered and exiled because of their religious and cultural differences, they were suffering. They were being persecuted for their new faith. They were facing hostility and harassment from their Greek and Roman neighbors. So as we look at the setting that they were in in the story, I want us to try and identify with that setting. Now, we're not in any way suffering because of our faith. But in some ways, I think we can identify with what it feels like to be scattered as a society, to feel exiled or isolated, and to feel that as a church. And this new world that we're living in is foreign to all of us. And so these people in the, in the early church, they couldn't gather as a church like they wanted to. We can't gather as a church like we want to. Their world as they knew it was changing. Our world is changing. So we can jump into this story a little bit. Let's move on and look at the characters that Peter writes to. In verse 2, he says, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So Peter is saying the Father knew you. You've been chosen by God, you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, and you've been made holy by the Spirit. So he introduces the characters of this story by focusing on who they are, on their identity in Christ, not on what they should do. You would think maybe if Peter's writing a letter to these Christians who are finding themselves scattered and as foreigners, he might jump right in and say, well, here's what I want you to do. But he doesn't. He says, here's what, here's, you're scattered, but here's who you are. Here's what, who you are, what Christ has done for you. He acknowledges the setting, but reminds them of their identity in Christ. Identity actually happens to be the word that I've chosen to press into this year in 2020. I came to understand at the end of 2019 how important it is and how foundational it is for me to understand and see myself the way that God sees me. Not the way that I might see myself or the expectations that I have, but to realize that in God, in Christ, I am chosen, I am forgiven, I am holy. Pastor Kirby's been teaching in recent weeks that our behavior flows out of our identity. Who we believe we are and what we believe is important determines what we do and how we live. I'm learning how to let my identity determine my behavior. And so that requires a shift for me. Instead of asking, what am I accomplishing today? And I might ask that when I get to work. What am I going to accomplish today uh, at work as in my pastoral ministry? What am I going to accomplish at home with my family? What am I going to accomplish for my physical health and take care of myself? And those things can become my identity. So instead of asking, what am I accomplishing today? I'm learning to ask, who does God want me to become today? Who does he want me to become as a pastor? And the experiences that come throughout my day are part of that process. Who does he want me to become as a mom to my two daughters? Who does he want me to become as a healthy and whole individual? That becomes my identity, understanding how God sees me and what he wants for me. And so this is what Peter helps these Christians understand, who they are becoming and that's a future focus, and that's exactly where he goes in the next couple of verses. We read in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 6, now we live. So he's saying, now that we understand who we are in Christ, we understand that we are cleansed and made holy and chosen, now we can live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance that is kept in heaven for us, for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad 
there's wonderful joy ahead. So here's our basic plot of the story. These Christians are part of a new family. They have left their Roman and Greek religion. They have followed Jesus. Their new family is centered around Jesus. They have a new identity. And so as God's beloved children, they have this new hope of a world that will be reborn by God's love when Jesus returns as king. And this future hope gives great expectation. The NIV says it's a living hope. We have an inheritance that's kept in heaven. Our faith will be proved genuine when Jesus is revealed. This sounds good. This is a great story that he's telling. So he says, be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead. And then bam, here's the plot twist. Let's pick it back up in verse six and move on to verse seven. He says, so be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. Peter says, be truly glad, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Now, if you remember back in the day, there was a campaign of, don't worry, be happy. It kind of sounds a little bit like this to me, what Peter's saying, like, how are we supposed to have joy and hope? How's that possible when the suffering and, 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 and conflict is going on around us? I believe that these Christians had to have questioned the suffering. They had to have been asking, why is God allowing this? We've just embraced him, we love him, we trust him. Why is he allowing this? Why can't we just live our lives as normal? Now, earlier this week on Facebook, we posted a question that said, what phrase or gif best captures the 2020 plot twist that we are living? So here's what some of you shared with us. Take a look. I think we all feel that, don't we? Especially that last one, like, what is happening? Anytime a conflict or a plot twist comes that we're not expecting it, we just don't know what to do. And I think these early Christians felt that way too. They, they, they heard this good news and they said, yes, this sounds amazing. Then all of a sudden they're being persecuted and, 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 and tortured. And so in these verses, we see Peter start to develop this theme and he points them back to spiritual truth. He doesn't sugarcoat the hardship and try and make it, you know, oh, it's not really that bad, or he doesn't give them a false hope that it's soon going to go away, but he helps them understand the conflict is real, but it develops the theme of what God is doing in their lives. Just like in these stories and movies that we enjoy so much, the conflict and, and seeing how it's resolved reveals the theme of the story, the moral of the story, the message the writer wanted to convey. And I, I kind of think that if we had a story without the conflict, there wouldn't necessarily be a happy ending because it would just be expected. So when we get to this happy ending, we realize looking back, the conflict wasn't wasted. The misery, the suffering, the trouble wasn't wasted. And so Peter's developing this theme of hope for these early Christians. And we find out more about this in the next verses, 8 and 9. He says, you love him. You love God, even though you've never seen him. And though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. So he's here pointing them back to this idea he talked about earlier, where he said, now we live with great expectation and we have this living hope, not because of anything to do with our situation and our circumstance, but because of who we know God is and who he's making us to be and the bigger plan that he has. I have hanging in my office a picture of a, a flower blooming that helps me remember what hope is. It says the hope is waiting 
with expectation for the good and miraculous things that God will unfold. Hope is not waiting with expectation for the conflict to end. That's endurance. And hope is not waiting with expectation for life to return to normal. That might just be plain foolishness. And hope is not waiting with expectation for the government to step in and provide relief, though we're grateful for that. Hope is about God. We wait with expectation to see how he will use our conflict to, to, to develop the theme and write the rest of the story. Do you know God in a way that you can love and trust him to write your story? I'd love to have a conversation with you about that. You can contact us during the week and, and, and we, can, we can talk more about that because that's the essence of faith. And this is what Peter is encouraging these early Christians with, these new Christians. He says it takes faith to love a God that we can't see. But when our faith is genuine, we find a glorious, inexpressible joy. And that's why we can rejoice in these trials, why we can have hope and why we can have peace. Because we can trust God to use our current conflict to develop the bigger story that he's writing for our lives. God knows our identity. He knows who he wants us to become. He's chosen us. And as much as you might desperately want to go back to normal, are you prepared to accept the reality that life might not be the same? That God, that might not be part of his story to go back to normal. COVID introduced a plot twist. It changed the story for sure but it doesn't mean it's the end of your story. Again, Peter tells this through this letter to these early Christians who were exiled because of their persecution. He wanted them to appreciate the value of their suffering, to know that it had a place in God's bigger story. I'm sure that they prayed and said, God, take away the suffering, stop the persecution, let us have a life that's safe. Let, us, let our life return to normal. But God didn't let their story return to normal. How did their story end? How did God use the plot twist to develop this theme of hope? Let's skip ahead a little bit to a future chapter written in God's bigger story. We know from hindsight that because the church was scattered, the gospel was able to spread to more people around the world. God used their conflict to write an ending they wouldn't have imagined. Now, what if they had walked out on the story? Where would we be today? Now, having church online during this season for us, it means that we are reaching people who would not have come to a church building. Some of you listening today are searching for answers and for hope, but the idea of a, going to a church building freaks you out, and that's okay. But in your living room or in your kitchen or wherever you're at today, you can experience hope in Jesus Christ. And by us engaging with you online, we are going to where you are. We're meeting you where you're at. We're bringing Jesus to you. So as a church, let's appreciate the value of what this season has done for the message of Jesus Christ around the world. And I want to challenge you to take that personally and look at the elements of your own story. Take some time after we're done here uh, and, and write, write these things down and begin to watch what God is doing. You can do this as a family. You can do it with your life group. You can do it on your own. Uh, we'll provide a little bit of a guide in the comments to this video, and then it's also on our website under this, the past sermons. So begin by just acknowledging the setting that we're in. We have to describe what's happening around us. Understand your identity as a character in God's story and who you are becoming Press into that. Ask God, how do you see me, God? Who, am I, who are you making me to become? Review the plot then. Look at what God has done in your life so far. What has been the story that, is, that has been told? It's already been written. 
and then name the conflict. What is it about COVID or whatever other conflict might be happening in your life? What is it that created a plot twist that you weren't expecting? And then begin to look for a theme that God might be developing in your life. And maybe this conflict is going to be a part of what he is doing. And I hope that doing that will help you appreciate the value of your current conflict, not because of the conflict. I am not asking anyone to say that they are glad that COVID came. We don't have to appreciate the conflict, but we can trust that it has a place in God's bigger story, even if we can't see it yet. Because at the end of time, here's the good part. We know how our story ends. We have a future inheritance. We know that God is protecting us. There is joy ahead. Our faith is being made strong. We have experienced God's salvation of our souls, and one day we will be in heaven with Jesus. Now, we don't know what's going to take place between now and then and how the story will unfold, but we can have this living hope because we believe that God will use our current conflict and this awful plot twist to develop a bigger story that reaches into eternity. We don't know what in the world he will accomplish through this plot twist, but let's not fight it. If we trust that God is writing an incredible story, if we don't put the book down, if we stick with it all the way to the happily ever after that we are promised in heaven with Jesus, we will find the joy and the peace and the hope that God has given us. And we can have that today. And it will be a great story that reaches far beyond 2020. Can I pray for you? Oh God, you are good. What you do is good and what you are doing is good. Thank you for being a part of our lives and for writing a story that, that we can't see and we trust you. It takes so much, so much love and trust, God, to be able to let, to let you write our story. But God, we trust that it will be good. We know that there will be conflict because every story has conflict. But God, you are with us in it. Give us a fresh glimpse of how you see us. Give us just a little taste of, of knowing what you want us to become and what you're doing in our lives. We look forward to the day when we will see the end of the story and look back and know that you saw us through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.